Hey Integrity fam, we're back with Hacker Heroes. Today we're having episode number eight, Time is Flying. And for that episode, we're having Nathaniel Latimer on the show. And he is also known under his Twitter handle and hacker handle, Dona. So make sure to check out what Nathaniel has to say. Hey, Nathaniel, how's it going? Thank you very much for being on the show with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. Tell, tell me and the audience a little bit about you. Who is Nathaniel Latimer? Uh, sure. So I am a, a lead security engineer at Grapple. Uh, so we, we kind of like work on like a scene product. So perhaps security people have heard of like Splunk kind of in the same space. Um, but before that, I was doing uh, offensive security at Cruise and AppSec at Dropbox, where I'm in the bug bunny community, at least known for uh, having run the bug bunny program at Dropbox uh, and also a bug bunny hunter on the side. So, yeah. That's pretty cool. How did you uh, get into IT security initially? Um, yeah, so the story with that is when I first, uh, when I first started working as a software dev, like full-time first job, uh, pretty early on, one of my coworkers showed up at my desk and was like, Hey man, I'm like super swamped. Um, can you take this security champion role off my hands? Uh, I need to go like work on this project. I can't be like showing up to the meetings and like doing this type of work. Uh, and so I was like, sure. Yeah. Uh, wanted to like prove myself. So to really kind of like own that role, I, I was like, okay, I don't know anything about security really. So I'm going to go online and try to learn as much as I can about it so that I can like, you know, impress people and be, and, and they'll like trust me with the role and, and all that. I was really trying to just like do better as a software dev, but then found security so fascinating that I realized that that's actually what I want to do. Yeah, and what did you use back then? If you you were just saying you were going online, what resources did you use in, in the beginning? Yeah, so I, I I didn't really know what to look for. Uh, I I started off just like doing the haphazard googling and um, kind of like trying to pick up keywords from like the security team that uh, at our company that I was starting to make friends with. Um, and so I think the big ones for me, aside from Google, which was really just kind of leading me to random blog posts, and I would try to piece concepts together was OWASP was super helpful, not so much in the explanations section because, uh, you know, like I, I could read through that maybe something doesn't make sense or maybe it, it's information wasn't, you know, particularly good or up to date for something, but it was such a great collection of words to go and then deep dive in on Google. Mm -hmm. So that was what was helpful to me. Cause I was like, oh, I can like learn about like, not just vulnerabilities, but like more importantly, like web, uh, security technologies. So understanding about like different patterns people use for mitigating different types of attacks, what kind of things right. do browsers have for you? It was really, really helpful. And then you just got so excited about it that you, you shifted yeah. entirely to a lead security engineer role. Is that correct? Well, not, not straight into lead, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think it was, it's not also not just web too. Uh, I, I was a huge math and science kid when I was in school. So actually the very first thing I jumped into was learning uh, basics of cryptography. So I, I like was learning how to do RSA by hand and like understanding Diffie-Hellman and really trying to build an intuition for those things. And then started learning like security areas outside of cryptography. So then web and, and then start doing some like binary exploitation stuff uh, right. as well. Did, did you do that like on the side or was that, did that become part of your work? Oh no, that was, that was like on the side, you know, I was just trying to like learn that stuff so that I could then show up to work the next day and like hey, not do that needed. sadly, but yeah. <laughs> but then like when I, when I was needed, you know, it would be cool. Mm -hmm. But then eventually you, you kept on growing in, in your like security role and, and now you're a lead security engineer, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can, yeah. can, can you explain to us how a typical day looks like for you as a security engineer? Um, yeah, so I think the situation with where I'm working now is a little bit special because the company I work now with now is like a really small startup, um, okay. with some like friends of mine. So I do a lot more of like the engineering side of work that might be kind of equivalent to software dev, but, uh, whenever we're discussing new features or migrating to new systems, like, uh, myself and, uh, 
a couple of other people on the team that are also uh, ex-security people from other companies. Uh, we are kind of like the voice of security. And so we'll we'll try to be like, hey, we got to be aware of these things or like this is not a sufficient mitigation for this particular type of risk or, or something like that. So uh, that's like some of the stuff that we'll do. But when I worked at more mature companies that I could work in a more, you know, specifically security role, it was a lot of, there's a lot of code review, designing of systems um, that were very security focused or uh, design review. So some other team wanted to build something, they'd fill out a doc with like what it is, like how it's supposed to work, what it interacts with, um, right. risks they thought through and just kind of review that. So you were actually more of a security ar architect, right? If, uh, if I that yeah, right. so, I mean, maybe somewhat, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, that's pretty nice. What uh can you can you give us some of the the biggest challenges you got to work on at your job right now? What like if if yeah. somebody was about to do the same or wanted to do the same what you're doing right now? What would be the biggest challenges people would have to look out for? Yeah, so I think an example of one of the big ones that came up recently is we have like a requirement for one of the features that we're trying to build right now where uh, from the security standpoint, you kind of have to look at it as taking malware and running it in your like AWS infrastructure, right? Uh, you know, just untrusted code. We can't do anything to like validate it in, in any particular way. So it's just supplied to us and we have to run this in with our AWS infrastructure. How do you do that safely, right? Like mm -hmm. bug hunters want to look for like the smallest little SSRF. Like we're saying like, here's code exec. Like, how do you make that safe? So it's it's a pretty tough one. Right, right. Yeah, you always have the the defender's dilemma, eh? Like they only yeah. need one bug, but you need to secure it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to jump a little bit into your background as a bug bounty hunter, if you don't mind. Mm. Yeah. What was like in in general? Like, what was the first time that you heard about bug bounty? Yeah, that wasn't until after I had joined Dropbox. My boss was running the bug bounty program at the time so he answered like all the the bugs that were coming in he had to leave for a conference uh and he was going to be gone for like a week and so he asked me if i could run it i i had never heard of bug bounties before that i was like okay i'll, I'll uh, run the program <laughs> i was reading through a lot of the old reports because we weren't getting a ton of reports at the time so i read through the old ones to like kind of learn what to expect and i was just mind blown because i had like come into the company thinking like Wow, they really had their like you know their stuff together, and that I I was like I don't know if I could find a vuln in the company right away because I was still so new to security at the time, um, and I was just really impressed seeing the kinds of stuff that people would find, and so that right. kind of led me down the rabbit hole. That that's pretty cool. Yeah, being being a program manager, and we'll we'll talk about this a little later, is <laughs> is pretty insightful. Um, do you remember the first book that you have submitted by yourself? Yes. Uh, so I, I remember that night so clearly, actually. <laughs> I remember sitting down and I had like put this off for like a month. I'd been trying to hype myself up to do it. But there was like some element within me thinking that if I didn't find a bug, that it was kind of proving to myself that I wasn't at that level yet. So I was like, I, was, I had the mental block. So eventually one day I was just like, that's it. I'm going to just do this thing. So I sit down. I was on, I had like a private program invite uh, for some particular reason. Uh, I went on there and I was like, I'm going to find a bug here. This site looks so old. It looks so janky. There's got to be something here. And I remember seeing um, uh, like an endpoint that would return JSON. And I like, I thought I had the basis for a MIME type sniffing XSS, which is like super, super awful XSS to submit. But uh, I thought I had this, and so I submitted it, and it got close as informative, and I, I was like a little discouraged at that. But like, not even two hours later, I found another one that was actually legitimate. Submitted that and got paid two hundred and fifty bucks, and so that was my nice. first experience. Yeah, it was the same bug, two different cases. One of them just didn't sanitize properly. The the first big thrill that you experienced in bug bounty hunting, absolutely hooked right after. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so nowadays, I mean, you were saying you're, you're working on a startup, which usually consumes a lot of time and you mm -hmm. probably have a lot of other things you're working on, but do you, do you still find time for bug bounty hunting? And if so, how many hours a week do you, do you spend on bug bounties approximately? 
Yeah, I think when I started, it was some really crazy hours because I was just straight up addicted. So it was like 20, 30, 40 hours each week. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, really, really ridiculous because I was just trying to learn as much as I could. Um, but nowadays, I don't do it uh, quite quite as much, probably maybe three or four hours a week. And I, my goals have changed. So it's not so much trying to find bugs because I like like getting the payouts or like you know challenging myself in that particular way but i do it as kind of like research mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll like try to understand how did i even find this bug and like what is the pattern that shows up here because i think that is a lot more interesting to solve bigger problems so i guess then you're also way more picky if it comes to selecting a specific program right uh Nowadays. yes very yes very picky <laughs> um if you think of your memories that you have in, in combination with your Buck Bunny career, what's the, the best, biggest, I don't know, most awesome memory that you have? I kind of have, I think maybe three big moments. Okay. Um, <laughs> two of them are really quick. Uh, so uh, the one of them was, I, I remember getting invited to this private program. I just hopped on. And I was like, okay, this is it. Like, it's super new. It just came out. Everyone else is, it's like, I, I felt like I was at like, you know, the races, all the horses at the gate and it's like the gates <laughs> open and then we were off, right? So there's no time to dilly dally. You got to like find those bugs as quick as you can. Um, I was able to, uh, through like, like simple open source tools, nothing special, open source word lists, all that stuff. Just find an SSRF by going to like some subdomain and like digging into the JavaScript, found an SSRF that gave me complete access to everything in their AWS because they had like an incredibly flat open in, uh, like structure in the oh AWS. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was super crazy. I remember when I found it, I like realizing how bad that bug was for that company. I was like, this is actually game over for this company. If this was found and somebody wanted to end this, like the company would just be done. And I was like actually shaking and had to walk around the block before I could even type the report out. <laughs> so, and it was like, I had but you lose time night. doing that. You lose time. <laughs> I, I know you lose time, but I was like, I actually couldn't articulate a sentence on the keyboard because I was just so jazzed. This other time there was a program that on their policy page, they said, uh, like RCE is super interesting to us. And I was like, well, I think it's to everyone. Uh, but then after that, they said, CSRF is really interesting to us. And I was like, that's really odd. I mean, CSRF is cool and interesting as a good find, but um, why would you call that out alongside RCE? And when I looked at the app, I realized why. It was like the most peculiar app I'd ever seen. Most apps, they basically will like, you know, maybe if it's, it's RESTful API, it'll say like, oh, user wants to add this item to their cart or a user wants to delete this widget. Uh, this app would say the user clicked on this button and then the back end would keep track of where you were in the app. And it all went to a single endpoint posting up like XML. And I was like, what? This is like the weirdest thing I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. Uh, and I see what they, and I saw immediately why they thought the CSRF would be interesting because they had something in place they thought would protect it, but they had made a crucial mistake. And so when I finally figured out how to build the POC. Cause it was very, it wasn't straightforward at all. There was a whole like ID tracking system. I had to like figure out multiple bypasses for, mm -hmm. but when I finally built the six step POC, uh, I was able to like get CSRF on every single action. When I submitted that, they like removed it from the policy page. And I loved that. That was like my <laughs> personal trophy. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think that probably covers it for the big ones. Sweet, sweet. And uh, one last one about Buck Bunnies. Has Buck Bunnies um, opened any doors for you? Um, I, I would definitely say so. Uh, one, it's a great thing to talk about in an interview because it's, it turns out that for like security, I think a lot of, especially like AppSec people and OffSec people have done it or at least dabbled in it. And I mean, Buck Bunnies are hard. So oftentimes like, they may not have like any significant findings or a lot of them. So they love hearing the stories though. Mm -hmm. uh, and like trading stories with those people is really great. So yeah, I think it's kind and, of- And you're it. having this big reputation, right? So you can yeah. actually brag a little bit about it if you get go into to an interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's like really cool stuff. Um, but it also, 
I think the bug bounty aspect adds some level of like credence to your advice on like, um, like the areas of expertise that you claim to have. So like, for example, mm -hmm. I'm very focused on web security. So I noticed that after doing a bunch of bug bounties and like getting to talk about that, that people would ask me for advice on like, Hey, Nathaniel, do you think this is like particularly safe for like this web thing or whatever? Mm -hmm. Um, so that was cool. Yeah. That's pretty nice. Like yeah. gaining a lot of credibility. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I want to jump over, you were saying you were managing at one point after your, your boss had handed over the, the Dropbox bug bunny program to you, you're managing it fully. Can you give us like a quick insight how the bug bunny world looks like from the other side? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, not as glamorous as like the actual hunting. I can tell you that, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a lot more of, uh, patience organization and like trying, trying to understand another party that like inherently this conversation is like already a stressful one, right? Like the company receiving a bug is stressed because they may rec be receiving a legitimate, like finding that impacts mm -hmm. their security, their customers, like all sorts of stuff. And then the other party is like, am I getting paid for this? Right. Um, and so it's, it's definitely kind of like a, a balancing act there from the other side, a lot of what I had to do was like interfacing with internal teams because, and this was a surprise to me when I first joined security, security teams don't fix bugs. We're like mm -hmm. the subject matter experts that will help a development team understand what the risk is to us and like whether a mitigation is sufficient or like suggesting mitigations but they're building it and they're fixing it. So, um, a lot of it is like, Hey, like, hey, have you scheduled time to fix this? And like following up on things that have fallen out of order. And it sounds really boring and it really is like, I, I do not like that part of the job. <laughs> no one, no one should, I, I don't think. Um, and the other thing that people need to understand is a lot of dev work is planned like in advance. So they're going to be like, Hey, we're going to work on these features this quarter. And so like your, your team, is basically the wrench constantly thrown in their plans. So I'm like, hey, we got a bug for your feature. And they're like, but we planned all the work and we have like all these person hours planned out for these different things. Uh, and, and it gets even worse if you have like a particular feature that's very often showing up in bug reports. So, Right. Yeah. I, I do have a question. So just a quick background information. I was running a bug bunny program as well in the past mm. and as a program manager. And I found it particularly hard sometimes to give remediation guidelines, especially if it's in like um, a piece of tax stack that you, you never worked with before. Oh, right? How, yes. how did you manage that? Because that to me was like the biggest challenge, you know, as, as you yeah. just said, like the, the, the dev teams, they're waiting for some guidance some remediation guidelines and you're standing there and you have not coded a single line in whatever language yet and they then they ask you as like the expert but you you're kind of not at the same time <laughs> yeah i mean I, and I, I actually that's such a great point because that extends even before you're talking to those teams like when you receive that report and they're like hey i can do this thing in this in this feature and you're like i've never heard of this feature this is the first <laughs> time i'm learning about it. i should go read our docs yeah. so like it's yeah uh, th that's the thing is like security teams like you may have like two or three thousand people in the company and then your security team is like 10 people mm -hmm. or like 20 people and like maybe from the other side people look at that and you're like they submit a bug and they're like how come you don't know about this thing it's like man like there's only so much of the stack that we can know about exactly uh, in terms it, yeah in terms of how i like worked on that it was mostly um, like consulting with other people on our team that, you know, have like the long gray beard of being back from old, you know, when, <laughs> when the company was first founded or something. Yeah. When the first stone was laid down. Um, yeah, usually a lot of that tons of digging through source code to try to understand stuff and then tons right. of research when it comes to mitigation. So like, like what are the people doing? Like how, what exists in this framework or this language to help solve these problems? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, quickly want to talk about, um, the bug bunny scene in the U S as you mm. obviously U S based, you, I assume you have a little experience over there. Um, what does the scene look like in general? Like all over the country is it big. I uh, assume. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm actually not a hundred percent sure. Uh, that the thing is that I never even like really focused on, you know, 
bug bounty scene being in the US because a lot of my experience had immediately been super international. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of people I was reading reports for, like, for example, like Franz Rosen, right, from Sweden. Sweden so like, yeah. I, I'm like, I, like, I know a ton of US based hackers, because like, I'll, I'll like chat with them pretty regularly. I'm friends with them. But outside of that, I don't even know if I want to like, claim that I know what the US scene in particular looks like. Um, okay, but that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you see the like, not speaking of the US then right now, just in general, like, how do you see the bug bunny scene right now? And how do you think it's going to develop in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, that's a good one. So one of the things that I am kind of happy about is that when I first joined the bug bounty community, I kind of immediately saw the need for more automation. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of was saying to people like, oh, I think there's going to be more automation, more automation. But whenever you say there's going to be more automation for anything in any field, bug bounties or elevators, or whatever, uh, they, you get a lot of pushback immediately. But now I think a couple of years later, we're starting to see a lot more of that. Uh, I talk to a lot of people who have built out like, you know, automated subdomain takeover kind of stuff. Uh, and every single person that I talk to that builds out like a relatively good solution for that ends up immediately making money mm -hmm. on that. And they're getting a ton of findings and stuff. <laughs> and it kind of blows my mind personally, because I'm like, hasn't this horse been like beaten to death enough? But uh, I guess there's, you know, more opportunity there. And I think another thing that is important is like more of a move to tool assisted stuff. Like uh, Nuclei is probably the f a great example of this, where uh, what I mean by the tool assisted is like being able to describe the kind of task you want to do and then having that tooling automatically do it without needing the verbosity of a whole programming language. Right, so I think yeah. Nuclei is a great example of like kind of a, pro a preliminary version of this, but yet look how prolific it is. Like everyone's using it. So yeah. I'm like, I, I think there's going to be a lot more of that. And uh, yeah, I think that's kind of like where we're moving. What are you referring to today's new if it comes to Septimain takeover automation? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess he found like 50% of all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure he has like 50% of the internet on his name cheap account or whatever. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's crazy. Uh, crazy, crazy to me to see. But yeah, I, I agree. Like automation is, is going to be a big one. Any, anything else apart from automation that you see coming or changing in the next five to 10 years? Hmm. Um, that's a, that's a tough one. Maybe, maybe, totally maybe sure. ask, let's, let me ask you a specific one. Do you, do you think there will be more adoption in the field? Like, do you think more and more companies will realize that they need a bug bunny program? Uh, yes. So, okay. That's, that's actually a great point. Um, I am aware of like some people that reach out to companies just like asking about bug bunny programs and a couple years ago when they were doing that, there was a lot more pushback, uh, at least that I heard of. But nowadays, like I've got some people that I know about that like don't really, I guess, miss with those things. Like they'll reach out and be like, hey, do you have a bug bounty program? It's like, uh, no, but feel free to let us know if you find something kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I think that's like the first stage. And then once those companies like start seeing maybe things or see some potential value there, or maybe get the hint that they should have like a VDP or a bug bounty program that they kind of move into that. And not to mention, at least in the United States, the federal government making it kind of like a mandate, huge, huge steps. So like, first of all, you know, props to the U S government. Uh, oh yeah. Like that's awesome. So, and obviously other countries, governments have already taken the plunge. So. Right, yeah. right, right. Sweet. So I want to pick your brain a little bit. Mm -hmm. about your personal hacking style. So what are you doing first when you approach a new target? Um, so I think it depends on whether or not I have the sense of like, do I have time? And I don't mean like, do I have enough time to like sit down and hack tonight? But more like, am I at the gate with the other people for when the program first launches? Or is this like a program that's existing? Mm -hmm. So when it, when it first launches, and maybe this is bad, it kind of changes my behavior where I will go to the places that I am, that I feel that I'm likely going to find something right away. So the types of integrations or types of functionality, stuff that's deep in your like configurations and settings, I will start playing with those features first because that's right. usually where people are going to make 
uh, egregious mistakes. And I'll also be able to build an idea of what this app is doing or this thing is doing. Um, but if I don't have a lot of time, or sorry, if I do have a lot of time, I might do like a pretty comprehensive, like, like look over of the recon and actually play with the app a ton first. So I actually mm -hmm. do build that understanding and kind of learn about how do all the different features work, get a nice view of all the endpoints in burp kind of thing. Yeah. Sweet. Has yeah. there been a, a new tool that you've added to your toolbox recently? Um, not particular. I mean, I, I built one called Armada, which is a port scanner. Uh, so kind of like replaces Nmap for situations that you need to do like millions of ports, port scanned or something. So if you have a huge CIDR range um, that you need a port scan, that's probably it. But I, yeah, I don't really dabble too much in um, like exploring uh, lots of other tooling. Right. So you have your fixed set of tools and, and you're good with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll play How with the burp extensions, but yeah. Yeah, those are great. How do you react if you find a vulnerability? Oh man, I already I, I already mentioned if it's a good one, I'll like I'll <laughs> shake and be like, oh my god, like what is going on here? This is crazy. Yeah, you um, mentioned you you were like making loops around you, around yeah, your, your building. <laughs> not the first time I had to do that too. I've I've definitely done that for a couple of bugs. Usually that's like the good ones. Well, and I'm like, oh man, I know this is a crazy find. Uh, but yeah, you, I get way jazzed up. Like it's, your, it's hard to your neighbors be a... like, what the heck is he doing again? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Sweet. Um, so if you would sit down with a hacker who's a complete newcomer one week, mm -hmm. two weeks into the game. And, and you were about to give away one big advice. What is it? I would say stop learning about vulnerabilities and learn about technologies. So sit down and understand how do different midi like web mitigations work in the browser and mm -hmm. like maybe learn a, a uh, programming language like well enough that you could write an app in it and that okay. is going to do so much more for you so like the mozilla documentation fantastic place to go that's where i would absolutely spend hours just reading through that stuff right so basically become the dev first in order to understand what can go wrong and then start hacking it right yeah yeah it like when people get caught up on snags Having that knowledge will get you past that immediately and straight back to hacking. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that, then it's just like confusion, submitting like NA reports uh, and like asking questions that no one ends up answering in public forums kind of thing. So. Right. Yeah, yeah that's a really good one. Thanks for sharing that with our audience. All right, Nathaniel, I do have a couple of would you rather questions right now for you. Are, are you ready for this? I, I think I am. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, let me shoot. So would you rather report missing cookie flags or content injection? <laughs> I think I, I think content injection because I probably could spin that better, but dang, <laughs> that's it, rough. <laughs> spin it like into something more impactful? Yeah, like, I don't know, like maybe not say the word phishing, but allude to it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what I could do with flags. I don't know. Yeah. That's a tough one. And that's uh, both of those are usually out of scope. So it was yeah. <laughs> just, just let the audience know, don't go for this. Don't do it. It's, <laughs> it's, it was a fun question, not a serious one. Um, would you rather want to hack out of Yellowstone National Park or sitting at the top of the Statue of Liberty? Oh, Yellowstone. Easy. Yeah, easy. That sounds big, awesome. Big major guy? I yeah, I, yeah, I don't I don't go out enough for sure, but uh yeah, that sounds that sounds really nice and peaceful. Mhm. Mm yeah. As long as the Wi-Fi is working. Yeah, got to have that fiber connection. So run me a fiber out to the guys or I'll be good. <laughs> Probably prohibited into your national reserve, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to get wait, wait for Starlink, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, would you want to choose to hack on the bug bunny program? And by the way, little disclaimer, I don't know if they exist, 
this is an artificial question, but of Virgin Galactic or of Amazon Blue Origin? Probably Amazon Blue Origin. I think that sounds more interesting. But, oh, that's a tough one, actually, because... Well, like, Virgin Galactic was the first one, like, I think nine days earlier in space. And if it comes to that competition... I'm, I, I, man, I'm not even thinking about, like, who got the space first or anything. I'm, like, thinking, like, which company probably has the most spider webs, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I maybe, maybe, you know what, I'm, I'll change. Maybe Virgin Galactic. I think that sounds like it's got more interesting stuff. All right. All right. Yeah. Let's let's tell them that they should open up a, a bug bunny program. Um, yeah, triage from space. Do you like a lot of people I know want to change their profession at one point? Because we all know like the, the field of infosec is so fast paced. So at one point it could you know, like it could uh, come a day where you burn out a little bit and people usually say, When I turn fifty, when I turn sixty, I want to start something completely different. So if that would happen to you, would you rather become a professional YouTuber at this point or a coffee shop barista? All right. So absolutely the coffee shop barista. I have actually thought about this idea, but not so much the barista, but like opening my own shop. like cafe. Yeah. Okay. That yeah, sounds cool. And you, you get all the coffee for free. Oh, it's, and it smells so good all kind the time. <laughs> All right, one last one, mm. uh, short one. Would you rather try to hack a Tesla or a Porsche? Do I get to keep it? <laughs> Pro prob probably the Tesla, but if I get to keep it, the Porsche. If I, I don't know, yeah, I guess if, if you find a good flaw, you would get like a big bounty, so you could then buy I could buy with? one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, probably the Tesla, but mostly because I could just uh, ring up ZLZ for some help. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, thank you very much for answering those. Um, let's wrap this up. Do you have any final shout outs, anything else you wanna share with our audience? Sure, uh, I guess like in terms of shout outs, you know, shout outs to uh, ZLZ, Shell, like Zeely, Zayat, obviously Nahamsek, we're, we're really good friends. Uh, Shubs as well for being a really cool voice of reason and, and person to chat with. And uh, Stoke for the t-shirt, he'll know, he'll know what I mean <laughs> maybe years ago. I, I still have it. I, I found it recently. Um, yeah, I hope but, he's yeah. watching. I, I hope he watches it, yeah. Otherwise, you got to ping him. Yeah, somebody, somebody needs to at Stoke. <laughs> and yeah, I hope actually that he will be on the show at one point. So Ooh. Stoke, if you watch this, hit me up. We'll get you on the show. Check your DMs. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to share? Uh, I stream at twitch.tv slash donut PTR, D0NUTPTR. Check that out in the description. We'll link that for you. And yeah, that'll yeah. be it. Perfect. I hope we'll get to meet at one point in real life. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for being on the show. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This was really fun. Thank you very much again, Nathaniel, for being on the show with us today at the amazing insights that you've shared with us. For our next episode of Hacker Heroes, we're having Robin the Bates, and he's ranked number four in our all-time leaderboard. So make sure to check out that episode. In the meantime, please go down to the comment section and let us know if you have any person, hacker, that you want to see on the show. And yeah, subscribe in the top right corner. Give this video a like, and I'll see you folks soon. Yeah.